Chapter 4 of True Stories of Crime from the District Attorney's Office by Arthur Cheney Train. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Last of the Wiretappers. Sir, replied the knave unabashed, I am one of those who do make a living by their wits. John Felix, a dealer in automatic musical instruments in New York City, was swindled out of $50,000 on February 2, 1905, by what is commonly known as the wiretapping game. During the previous August, a man calling himself by the name of Nelson had hired Room 46 in a building at 27 East 22nd Street as a school for wireless telegraphy. Later on, he had installed over a dozen deal tables, each fitted with a complete set of ordinary telegraph instruments, and connected with wires which, while apparently passing out of the windows, in reality plunged behind a desk into a small dry battery. Each table was fitted with a shaded electric drop light, and the room was furnished with the ordinary paraphernalia of a telegraph office. The janitor never observed any activity in the school. There seemed to be no pupils, and no one haunted the place except a short, ill-favored person who appeared monthly and paid the rent. On the afternoon of February 1, 1905, Mr. Felix was called to the telephone of his store and asked to make an appointment later in the afternoon, with a gentleman named Nelson who desired to submit to him a business proposition. Fifteen minutes afterward, Mr. Nelson arrived in person and introduced himself as having met Felix at Lou Ludlam's gambling house. He then produced a copy of the evening telegram, which contained an article to the effect that the Western Union Telegraph Company was about to resume its pool room service. That is to say, to supply the pool rooms with the telegraphic returns of the various horse races being run in different parts of the United States. The paper also contained, in connection with this item of news, a photograph which might, by stretch of the imagination, have been taken to resemble Nelson himself. Mr. Felix, who was a German gentleman of French sympathies, married to an American lady, had recently returned to America after a ten-year sojourn in Europe. He had had an extensive commercial career, was possessed of a considerable fortune, and had at length determined to settle in New York, where he could invest his money to advantage, and at the same time conduct a conservative and harmonious business in musical instruments. Like the Teutons of old, Dwelling among the forests of the Elbe, Mr. Felix knew the fascination of games of chance, and he had heard the merry song of the wheel at both Hamburg and Monte Carlo. In Europe, the pleasures of the gaming table had been comparatively inexpensive, but in New York, for some unknown reason, the fickle goddess had not favored him, and he had lost upward of $51,000. Zuville, as he himself expressed it. Being of a philosophic disposition, however, he had pocketed his losses and contented himself with the consoling thought that, whereas he might have lost all, he had in fact lost only a part. It might well have been that had not the tempter appeared in the person of his afternoon visitor, he would have remained in status quo for the rest of his natural life. In the sunny window of his musical store, surrounded by zitherns, auto harps, dulcimers, psalteries, sackbuts, and other instruments of melody, the advent of Nelson produced the effect of a sudden and unexpected discord. Felix distrusted him from the very first. The proposition was simplicity itself. It appeared that Mr. Nelson was in the employ of the Western Union Telegraph Company, which had just opened a branch office for racing news at 27 East 22nd Street. The branch was under the superintendence of an old associate and intimate friend of Nelson's, by the name of McPherson. Assuming that they could find someone with the requisite amount of cash, they could all make their everlasting fortunes by simply having McPherson withhold the news of some race from the pool rooms long enough to allow one of the others to place a large bet upon some horse, which had in fact already won and was resting comfortably in the stable. Felix grasped the idea instantly. At the same time, he had his suspicions of his visitor. It seemed peculiar that he, an inconspicuous citizen who had already lost $50,000 in gambling houses, should be selected as the recipient of such a momentous opportunity. Moreover, he knew very well that gentlemen in gambling houses were never introduced at all. He thought he detected the odor of a rodent. He naively inquired why, 
if all these things were so nelson and his friend were not already yet millionaires two or three times the answer was at once forthcoming that they had been but also had been robbed unmercifully robbed by one in whom they had had confidence and to whom they had entrusted their money and now we are poor penniless clerks sighed nelson and if we should offer to make a big bet ourselves the gamblers would be suspicious and probably refuse to place it i think this looks like a schwindling game said felix shrewdly so it did so it was by and by felix put on his hat and escorted by nelson paid a visit to the branch office at twenty seven east twenty second street where once solitude had reigned supreme and the spider had spun his web amid the fast-gathering dust all was now tumultuous activity fifteen busy operators in eye shades and shirt sleeves took the news hot from the humming wires and clicked it off to the waiting pool rooms scarecrow wins by a neck cried one blackbird second make the odds five to three shouted a short ill-favored man who sat at a desk puffing a large black cigar the place buzzed like a beehive and ticked like a clockmaker's it had an atmosphere of breathless excitement all its own felix watched and marveled wondering if dreams came true the short ill-favored man strolled over and condescended to make mr felix's acquaintance an hour later the three of them were closeted among the zitherns at the same moment the fifteen operators were ranged in a line in front of a neighboring bar their elbows simultaneously elevated at an angle of forty-five degrees felix still had lingering doubts hadn't mr mcpherson some little paper a letter a bill a receipt or a check to show that he was really in the employ of the western union no said mac but he had something better the badge which he had received as the fastest operator among the company's employees felix wanted to see it but mac explained that it was locked up in the vault of the farmers loan and trust company to felix this had a safe sound farmers trust company then matters began to move rapidly it was arranged that felix should go down in the morning and get fifty thousand dollars from his bankers seligman and meyer after that he was to meet nelson at the store and go with him to the pool room where the big financiers played their money mcpherson was to remain at the office and telephone them the results of the races in advance by nightfall they would be worth half a million i hope you have a good large safe remarked nelson tentatively the three conspirators parted with mutual expressions of confidence and esteem next morning mr felix went to his bankers and procured fifty thousand dollars in five ten thousand dollar bills the day passed very slowly there was not even a flurry in zitherns he waited impatiently for nelson who was to come at five o'clock at last nelson arrived and they hurried to the fifth avenue hotel where the coup was to take place and now another marvel wasserman brothers stock brokering office which closes at three hummed just as the office had done the evening before and with the very same bees although felix did not recognize them it was crowded with men who struggled violently with one another in their eagerness to force their bets into the hands of a benevolent-looking person who felix was informed was the trusted cashier of the establishment and the sums were so large that even felix gasped make that forty thousand dollars on coco cried a bald-headed capper mr gates wants to double his bet on jackstone make it eighty thousand shrieked another gentlemen gentlemen begged the trusted cashier not quite so fast if you please one at a time sixty thousand on hesper for a place bawled one addressed as mr keene while messrs ryan whitney belmont sullivan mccarran and murphy all made handsome wagers from time to time a sporty-looking man standing beside a ticker shouted the odds and read off the returns felix heard with straining ears they're off baby leads at the quarter susan is gaining they're on the stretch satan wins by a nose peter second there was a deafening uproar hats were tossed ceilingward and great wads of money were passed out by the trusted cashier to indifferent millionaires felix wanted to rush in and bet at once on something if he waited it might be too late was it necessary to be introduced to the cashier no would he take the bet all right but at that moment a page elbowed his way among the money calling plaintively for felix mr felix shrinking at the thought of such publicity in such distinguished company felix caught the boy's arm and learned that he was wanted at the telephone booth in the hotel 
It must be Mac, said Nelson. Now don't make any mistake. Felix promised to use the utmost care. It was Mac. Is this Mr. Felix? Yes. Well, be very careful now. I'm going to give you the result of the third race, which has already been run. I will hold back the news three minutes. This is merely to see if everything is working right. Don't make any bet. If I give you the winners correctly, you can put your money on the fourth race. The horse that won the last is Colonel Starbottle. Don Juan is second. Now just step back and see if I am right. Felix rushed back to the pool room. As he entered, the man at the tape was calling out that they were off. In due course, they reached the quarter and then the half. A terrific struggle was in progress between Colonel Starbottle and Don Juan. First one was ahead and then the other. Finally, they came thundering down the stretch, Colonel Starbottle winning by a neck. Gates won $90,000, and several others pocketed wads running anywhere from $20,000 to $60,000. Felix hurried back to the telephone. Mac was at the other end. Now write this down, admonished McPherson. We can't afford to have any mistake. Old Stone has just won the fourth race with Calvert second. Play Old Stone to win at five to one. We shall make $250,000, and Old Stone is safe in the stable all the time, and his jockey is smoking a cigarette on the clubhouse veranda. Good luck, old man. Felix had some difficulty in getting near the trusted cashier. So many financiers were betting on Calvert. Felix smiled to himself. He'd show them a thing or two. Finally, he managed to push his envelope containing the five $10,000 bills into the trusted cashier's hand. The latter marked it Old Stone 5-1 to one to win, and thrust it into his pocket. Then Whitney or somebody bet $70,000 on Calvert. They're off, shouted the man at the tape. How he lived while they tore around the course, Felix never knew. Neck and neck, Old Stone and Calvert passed the quarter, the half, and the three-quarter post, and with the crowd yelling like demons came hurtling down the stretch. Old Stone wins, cried the booster at the tape in a voice husky with excitement. Calvert, a close second. Felix nearly fainted. His head swam. He had won a quarter of a million. Then the voice of the booster made itself audible above the confusion. What? A mistake? Not possible. Yes. Owing to some confusion at the finish, both jockeys wearing the same colors, the official returns now read Calvert first, Old Stone second. Among the zitherns, Felix sat and wondered if he had been schwindled. He had not returned to Wasserman Brothers. Had he done so, he would have found it empty five minutes after he had lost his money. The millionaires were already streaming hilariously into Sharkey's. Gates pledged Belmont and Keene pledged Whitney. Each had earned five dollars by the sweat of his brow. The glorious army of wiretappers had won another victory, and their generals had consummated a campaign of months. Expenses, roughly $600. Receipts, $50,000. Net profits, $48,400. Share of each, $16,133. A day or two later, Felix wandered down to police headquarters, and in the rogues' gallery identified the photograph of Nelson, whom he then discovered to be none other than William Crane, alias John Lawson, alias John Larson, a well-known wiretapper arrested some dozen times within a year or two for similar offenses. McPherson turned out to be Christopher Tracy, alias Charles J. Tracy, alias Charles Tompkins, alias Topping, alias Toppin, etc., etc., arrested some eight or ten times for wiretapping. The trusted cashier materialized in the form of one Wyatt, alias Fred Williams, etc., a wiretapper and pal of Chappie Moran and Larry Summerfield. Detective Sergeants Fogarty and Mundy were at once detailed upon the case and arrested within a short time both Nelson and McPherson. The trusted cashier who had pocketed Felix's $50,000 has never been caught. It is said that he is running a first-class hostelry in a western city, but that is another story. When acting Inspector O'Brien ordered McPherson brought into his private room, the latter unhesitatingly admitted that the three of them had trimmed Felix of his $50,000, exactly as the latter had alleged. He stated that Wyatt, alias Williams, was the one who had taken in the money, that it was still in his possession and still intact in its original form. He denied, however, any knowledge of Wyatt's whereabouts. The reason for this indifference became apparent when the two prisoners were arraigned in the magistrate's court, 
and their counsel demanded their instant discharge on the ground that they had committed no crime for which they could be prosecuted. He cited an old New York case, McCord versus the People, which seemed in a general way to sustain his contention, and which had been followed by another and much more recent decision, the People versus Livingston. The first of these cases had gone to the Court of Appeals, and the general doctrine had been enunciated that where a person parts with his money for an unlawful or dishonest purpose, even though he is tricked into so doing by false pretenses, a prosecution for the crime of larceny cannot be maintained. In the McCord case, the defendant had falsely pretended to the complainant, a man named Miller, that he was a police officer and held a warrant for his arrest. By these means he had induced Miller to give him a gold watch and a diamond ring as the price of his liberty. The conviction in this case was reversed on the ground that Miller parted with his property for an unlawful purpose. But there was a very strong dissenting opinion from Mr. Justice Peckham, now a member of the bench of the Supreme Court of the United States. In the second case, that of Livingston, the complainant had been defrauded out of $500 by means of the green goods game but this conviction was reversed by the appellate division of the second department on the authority of the McCord case. The opinion in this case was written by Mr. Justice Cullen, now Chief Judge of the New York Court of Appeals, who says in conclusion, We very much regret being compelled to reverse this conviction. Even if the prosecutor intended to deal in counterfeit money, that is no reason why the appellant should go unwhipped of justice we venture to suggest that it might be well for the legislature to alter the rule laid down in McCord versus the people. Well might the judges regret being compelled to set a rogue at liberty simply because he had been ingenious enough to invent a fraud, very likely with the assistance of a shyster lawyer, that involved the additional turpitude of seducing another into a criminal conspiracy. Livingston was turned loose upon the community, in spite of the fact that he had swindled a man out of five hundred dollars, because he had incidentally led the latter to believe that in return he was to receive counterfeit money or green goods which might be put into circulation. Yet, because some years before the judges of the Court of Appeals had, in the McCord matter, adopted the rule followed in civil cases, to wit, that as the complaining witness was himself in fault and did not come into court with clean hands, he could have no standing before them. The appellate division in the next case felt obliged to follow them, and to rule tantamount to saying that two wrongs could make a right, and two knaves one honest man. It may seem a trifle unfair to put it in just this way, but when one realizes the iniquity of such a doctrine as applied to criminal cases, it is hard to speak softly. Thus the broad and general doctrine seemed to be established that so long as a thief could induce his victim to believe that it was to his advantage to enter into a dishonest transaction, he might defraud him to any extent in his power. Immediately there sprang into being hordes of swindlers, who, aided by adroit shyster lawyers, invented all sorts of schemes which involved some sort of dishonesty upon the part of the person to be defrauded. The wiretappers, of whom Larry Summerfield was the Napoleon, the gold brick and green goods men, and the sick engineers flocked to New York, which, under the unwitting protection of the Court of Appeals, became a veritable mecca for persons of their ilk. To readers unfamiliar with the cast of mind of professional criminals, it will be almost impossible to appreciate with what bold insouciance these vultures now hovered over the metropolitan barnyard. Had not the Court of Appeals itself recognized their profession? They had nothing to fear. The law was on their side. They walked the streets, flaunting their immunity in the very face of the police. Wiretapping became an industry, a legalized industry, with which the authorities might interfere at their peril. Indeed, there is one instance in which a wiretapper successfully prosecuted his victim, after he had trimmed him, upon a charge of grand larceny arising out of the same transaction. One crook bred another every time he made a victim and the disease of crime, the most infectious of all distempers, ate its way unchecked into the body politic. Broadway was thronged by a prosperous gentry, the aristocracy and elite of knavery, who dressed resplendently, flourished like the green bay tree, and spent their, or rather their victim's money, with the lavish hand of one of Dumas' gentlemen. But the evil did not stop there. Seeing that their brothers prospered in New York, 
and neither being learned in the law nor gifted with the power of nice discrimination between rogueries, all the other knaves in the country took it for granted that they had at last found the Elysian fields and came trooping here by hundreds to ply their various trades. The McCord case stood out like a cabalistic sign upon a gatepost, telling all the rascals who passed that way that the city was full of honest folk waiting to be turned into rogues and trimmed. And presently we did pass a narrow lane, and at the mouth espied a written stone, telling beggars by a word like a wee pitchfork to go that way. The tip went abroad that the city was good graft for everybody, and in the train of the wiretappers thronged the flim-flammer, confidence man, booster, capper, and every sort of affiliated crook, recalling Charles Reed's account in the cloister and the hearth of Gerard in Lorraine among their kin of another period. Quote, with them and all they had, t'was lightly come and lightly go. And when we left them, my master said to me, This is thy first lesson, but tonight we shall be at Hansburg. Come with me to the rot boss there, and I'll show thee all our folk and their lays, and especially the Lossners, the Dutzers, the Schleppers, the Gickeses, the Schwanfelters, whom in England we call the Shivering Jemmies, the Sundtragers, the Schweigers, the Joners, the Cecil Deggers, the Gensharers, in France, Marcandiers, Arifodes, the Venerans, the Stabulaires, with a few foreigners like ourselves, such as Pietres, Franck Mito, Polissons, Malingro, Traders, Rufflers, Whipjacks, Damerers, Glimmerers, Jarkmen, Patricos, Swatters, Autumn Morts, Walking Morts. And no, cried I, stopping him art as gleesome as the evil one accounting of his imps. I'll jot down in my tablet all these caitiffs and their accursed names, for knowledge is knowledge. But go among them alive or dead, that will I not with my good will." Unquote. And a large part of it was due simply to the fact that seven learned men upon seven comfortable chairs in the city of Albany had said, many years ago, that neither the law nor public policy designs the protection of rogues in their dealings with each other or to ensure fair dealing and truthfulness as between each other in their dishonest practices. The reason that the wiretapping game was supposed to come within the scope of the McCord case was this. It deluded the victim into the belief that he was going to cheat the pool room by placing a bet upon a sure thing. Secondarily, it involved, as the dupe supposed, the theft or disclosure of messages which were being transmitted over the lines of a telegraph company, a misdemeanor. Hence, it was argued, the victim was as much a thief as the proposer of the scheme, had parted with his money for dishonest purpose, did not come into court with clean hands, and no prosecution could be sustained, no matter whether he had been led to give up his money by means of false pretenses or not. While wiretapping differed technically from the precise frauds committed by McCord and Livingston, it nevertheless closely resembled those swindlers in general character and came clearly within the doctrine that the law was not designed to protect rogues in their dealings with each other. No genuine attempt had ever been made to prosecute one of these gentry, until the catastrophe which deprived Felix of his $50,000. The wiretappers rolled in money. Indeed, the fraternity were so liberal with their roles that they became friendly with certain police officials, and intimately affiliated with various politicians of influence a friend of one of whom went on Summerfield's bond when the latter was being prosecuted for the sick engineer frauds to the extent of $30,000. They regularly went to Europe in the summer season and could be seen at all the race courses and gambling resorts of the continent. It is amusing to chronicle in this connection that just prior to McPherson's arrest, that is to say during the summer vacation of 1904, he crossed the Atlantic on the same steamer with an assistant district attorney of New York County, who failed to recognize his ship companion and found him an entertaining and agreeable comrade. The trial came before Judge Warren W. Foster in Part Three of the General Sessions on February 27, 1906. A special panel quickly supplied a jury, which, after hearing the evidence, returned in short order a verdict of guilty. As Judge Foster believed the McCord case to be still the law of the state, he, of his own motion and with commendable independence, immediately arrested judgment. The people thereupon appealed, 
the Court of Appeals sustained Judge Foster, and the defendant was discharged. It is, however, satisfactory to record that the legislature at its next session amended the penal code in such a way as to entirely deprive the wiretappers and their kind the erstwhile protection which they had enjoyed under the law. End of chapter 4. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 5 of True Stories of Crime from the District Attorney's Office by Arthur Cheney Train. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Franklin Syndicate. When Robert A. Amon, a member of the New York Bar, was convicted after a long trial on the 17th of June, 1903, of receiving stolen goods, he had, in the parlance of his class, been due for a long time. The stolen property in question was the sum of $30,500 in greenbacks, part of the loot of the notorious Franklin Syndicate, devised and engineered by William F. Miller, who later became the cat's paw of his legal adviser. The subject of this history. Amon stood at the bar and listened complacently to his sentence of not less than four years at hard labor in Sing Sing. A sneer curved his lips as, after nodding curtly to his lawyer, he turned to be led away by the court attendant. The fortune snatched from his client had procured for him the most adroit of counsel, the most exhaustive of trials. He knew that nothing had been left undone to enable him to evade the consequences of his crime, and he was cynically content. For years, Bob Amon had been a familiar figure in the Wall Street District of New York. Although the legal adviser of swindlers and confidence men, he was a type of American whose energies, if turned in a less dubious direction, might well have brought him honorable distinction. Tall, strong as a bull, bluff, good-natured, reckless, and of iron nerve, he would have given good account of himself as an Indian fighter or frontiersman. His fine presence, his great vitality, his coarse humor, his confidence and bravado, had won for him many friends of a certain kind, and engendered a feeling among the public that somehow, although the associate and adviser of criminals, he was outside the law, to the circumventing of which his energies were directed. Unfortunately, his experiences with the law had bred in him a contempt for it, which ultimately caused his downfall. The reporters are bothering you, are they? He had said to Miller in his office, hang them, send them to me, I'll talk to them. And talk to them he did. He could talk a police inspector or a city magistrate into a state of vacuous credulity, and needless to say, he was to his clients as a god knowing both good and evil, as well as how to eschew the one and avoid the other. Miller hated, loathed, and feared him, yet freely entrusted his liberty, and all he had risked his liberty to gain to this strange and powerful personality which held him enthralled by the mere exercise of a physical superiority. The Franklin Syndicate had collapsed amid the astonished outcries of its thousands of victims on November 24, 1899, when, under the advice and with the assistance of Amon, its organizer, 520% Miller, had fled to Canada. It was nearly four years later, in June 1903, that Amon, arraigned at the bar of justice as a criminal, heard Assistant District Attorney Knott call William F. Miller convict to the stand to testify against him. A curious contrast they presented as they faced one another, the emaciated youth of twenty-five, the hand of death already tightly fastened upon his meager frame, coughing, hollow-cheeked, insignificant, flat-nosed, almost repulsive, who dragged himself to the witness chair, and the swaggering athlete who glared at him from the bar surrounded by his cordon of able counsel. As Amon fixed his penetrating gaze upon his former client, Miller turned pale and dropped his eyes. Then the prosecutor, realizing the danger of letting the old hypnotic power return, even for an instant, quickly stepped between them. Miller raised his eyes and smiled, and those who heard knew that this miserable creature had been through the fire and come forth to speak true things. The trial of Amon involved practically the reproving of the case against Miller, for which the latter had been convicted and sentenced to ten years in state's prison, whence he now issued like one from the tomb to point the skeleton incriminating finger at his betrayer. But the case began 
by the convict witness testifying that the whole business was a miserable fraud from start to finish, carried on and guided by the advice of the defendant. He told how he, a mere boy of twenty-one, burdened with a sick wife and baby, unfitted by training or ability for any sort of lucrative employment, a hanger-on of bucket shops, and, in his palmiest days, a speculator in tiny lots of feebly margined stocks, finding himself without means of support, conceived the alluring idea of soliciting funds for investment promising enormous interest, and paying this interest out of the principal entrusted to him. For a time he preyed only upon his friends, claiming inside information of large deals, and paying ten per cent per week on the money received out of his latest deposits. Surely the history of civilization is a history of credulity. Miller prospered. His earlier friend-customers, who had hesitatingly taken his receipt for ten dollars, and thereafter had received one dollar every Monday morning, repeated the operation, and returned in ever-increasing numbers. From having his office in his hat, he took an upper room in a small, two-story house at 144 Floyd Street, Brooklyn, a humble tenement, destined to be the scene of one of the most extraordinary exhibitions of man's cupidity and foolishness in modern times. At first he had tramped round like a peddler, delivering the dividends himself and soliciting more. But soon he hired a boy. This was in February 1899. Business increased. The golden flood began to appear in an attenuated but constant rivulet. He hired four more employees and the whole top floor of the house. The golden rivulet became a steady stream. From a panhandler he rolled in ready thousands. The future opened into magnificent, auriferous distances. He began to call himself the Franklin Syndicate, and to advertise that the way to wealth is as plain as the road to the market. He copied the real brokers, and scattered circulars and weekly letters over the country, exciting the rural mind in distant Manitoba and Louisiana. There was an instantaneous response. His mail required the exclusive attention of several clerks. The stream of gold became a rushing torrent. Every Monday morning, the Floyd Street house was crowded with depositors who drew their interest, added to it, deposited it again, and went upon their way rejoicing. Nobody was going to have to work any more. The out-of-town customers received checks for their interest drawn upon the Franklin Syndicate, together with printed receipts for their deposits, all signed William F. Miller by means of a rubber stamp. No human hand could have signed to them all without writer's cramp. The rubber stamp was Miller's official signature. Then, with a mighty roar, the torrent burst into a deluge. The Floyd Street quarters were besieged by a clamoring multitude fighting to see which of them could give up his money first, and there had to be a special delivery for Miller's mail. He rented the whole house and hired fifty clerks. You could deposit your money almost anywhere, from the parlor to the pantry, the clothes closet or the bathroom. Fridays the public stormed the house en masse since the money must be deposited on that day to draw interest for the following week. The crush was so enormous that the stoop broke down. Imagine it, in quiet Brooklyn, people struggling to get up the steps to cram their money into Miller's pockets. There he sat behind a desk at the top of the stoop, solemnly taking the money thrown down before him and handing out little pink and green stamped receipts in exchange. There was no place to put the money, so it was shoved onto the floor behind him. Friday afternoons, Miller and his clerks waded through it knee-high. There was no pretense of bookkeeping. Simply in self-defense, Miller issued in October a pronunciamento that he could not, in justice to his business, consent to receive less than $50 at one time. Theoretically, there was no reason why the thing should not have gone on practically forever, Miller and everybody else becoming richer and richer. So long as the golden stream swelled five times each year, everybody would be happy. How could anybody fail to be happy, who saw so much money lying around loose everywhere? But the business had increased to such an extent that Miller began to distrust his own capacity to handle it. He therefore secured a partner in the person of one Edward Schlesinger, and with him went to Charlestown, Massachusetts, for the purpose of opening another office, in charge of which they placed a man named Lewis Powers. History repeated itself. Powers shipped the deposit to Miller every day or two by express. Was there ever such a plethora of easy money? But Schlesinger was no Miller. 
He decided that he must have a third of the profits, heaven knows how they computed them, and have them moreover each day, in cash. Hence there was a daily accounting, part of the receipts being laid aside to pay off interest checks and interest, and the balance divided. Schlesinger carried his off in a bag. Miller took the rest, cash, money, orders, and checks, and deposited it in a real bank. How the money poured in may be realized from the fact that the excess of receipts over disbursements for the month ending November 16th was $430,000. Hitherto Miller had been the central figure. Colonel Robert A. Amon now became the deus ex machina. Miller's advertising had become so extensive that he had been forced to retain a professional agent, one Rudolf Gunther, to supervise it, and when the newspapers began to make unpleasant comments, Gunther took Miller to Amon's office in the Bennett Building in Nassau Street. Amon accepted a hundred dollars from Miller, listened to his account of the business, and examined copies of the circulars. When he was handed one of the printed receipts, he said they were incriminating. Miller must try to get them back. He advised, as many other learned counselor has done, incorporating the business, since by this means stock could be sold and exchanged for the incriminating receipts. He explained the mistakes of the Dean crowd, but showed how he had been able to safeguard them in spite of the fact that they had foolishly insisted on holding the stock in their company themselves instead of making their customers the stockholders. Nevertheless, you do not see any of the Dean people in jail, boasted Amon. From now on, Miller and he were in frequent consultation, and Amon took steps to incorporate, procuring for that purpose from Wells Fargo and Company a certificate of deposit for $100,000. Occasionally, he would visit Floyd Street to see how things were going. Miller became a mere puppet. Amon twitched the wire. It was now well on in November, and the press of both Boston and New York was filled with scathing attacks upon the syndicate. The reporters became so inquisitive as to be annoying to the peaceful Miller. Send the reporters over to me, directed Amon. The Post of Boston said the whole thing was a miserable swindle. Amon, accompanied by Miller, carrying a satchel which contained $50,000 in greenbacks, went to Boston, visited the offices of the Post, and pitched into the editor. The business is all right. You must give us a fair deal. The pair also visited Watts, chief of police. You keep your mouth shut, said Amon to Miller. I'll do all the talking. He showed Watts the bag of money and demanded what he had meant by calling the enterprise a green goods business. If the thing wasn't all right, did Watts suppose that he, Colonel Robert A. Amon, would be connected with it? The chief backed down and explained that he had jokingly referred to the color of one of the receipts, which happened to be green. In spite of Amon's confidence, however, there was an uneasy feeling in the air, and it was decided to put an advertisement in the post offering to allow any customer who so desired to withdraw his deposit without notice upon the following Saturday. This announcement did not have precisely the anticipated effect, and Saturday saw a large crowd of victims eager to withdraw their money from the Boston office of the Franklin Syndicate. Powers paid the Pauls of Boston out of the bag brought on by Miller containing the deposits of the Peters of Brooklyn. Meantime, Amon addressed the throng, incidentally blackguarding a post reporter before the crowd, telling them that his paper was a yellow paper, had never amounted to anything and never would. Some timid souls took courage and redeposited their money. The run continued one day and cost Amon and Miller about $28,000. Amon took $5,000 cash as a fee out of the bag, and the pair returned to New York, but confidence had been temporarily restored. The beginning of the end, however, was now in sight, at least for the keen vision of Bob Amon. He advised stimulating deposits and laying hands on all the money possible before the crash came. Accordingly, Miller sent a telegram collect to all depositors. We have inside information of a big transaction to begin Saturday or Monday morning. Big profits. Remit at once so as to receive the profits. William F. Miller, Franklin Syndicate. A thousand or so were returned, the depositors having refused to pay the charges. The rest of the customers in large measure responded. But the game was nearly up. There were scare heads in the papers. Miller saw detectives on every corner, and like a rat leaving a sinking ship, Schlesinger scuttled away for the last time with a bag of money on the evening of Tuesday, November 21st, 1899. The rest of the deposits were crammed into Miller's desk and left there overnight. 
The next morning, Miller returned to Floyd Street and spent that day in the usual routine, and also on Thursday remained until about 12 o'clock noon, when he placed $30,500 in bills in a satchel and started for Eamon's office, where he found Schlesinger likewise with a satchel. The jig's up, announced Schlesinger. Billy, I think you'll have to make a run for it, said Eamon. The best thing for you is to go to Canada. It still remained to secure the money, which Miller had deposited in the banks, in such a way that the customers could not get hold of it. Eamon explained how that could easily be done. The money should be all turned over to him, and none of the creditors would ever see it again. He did not deem it necessary to suggest that neither would Miller. Accordingly, the two, the lawyer and the client, went to the office of Wells Fargo and Company, Eamon obligingly carrying the satchel containing the $30,500. Here, Eamon deposited the contents to his own account, as well as the certificate of deposit for $100,000 previously mentioned, and a check for $10,000 representing the balance of Miller's loot. In addition to this, he received an order for $40,000 United States government bonds, which were on deposit with Wells Fargo and Company, and later, through Miller's father, $65,000 in bonds of the New York Central Railroad and the United States government. Thus, Eamon secured from his dupe the sum of $245,500, the actual market value of the securities bringing the amount up to $250,500, besides whatever sums he had been paid by Miller for legal services, which could not have been less than ten or $15,000. The character of the gentleman is well illustrated by the fact that later when paying Mrs. Miller her miserable pittance of five dollars a week, he explained to her that he was giving her that out of his own money and that her husband owed him. There still remained, however, the chance of getting a few dollars more, and Eamon advised Miller to try to get Friday's receipts, which were the heaviest day's business. Acting on this suggestion, Miller returned to Floyd Street the next morning, at about half-past nine, finding a great crowd of people waiting outside. About one o'clock he started to go home, but discovering that he was being followed by a man whom he took to be a detective, he boarded a streetcar, dodged through a drugstore in a Chinese laundry, finally made the elevated railroad with his pursuer at his heels, and eventually reached the lawyer's office about two o'clock in the afternoon. Word was received almost immediately over the telephone, that Miller had been indicted in Kings County for conspiracy to defraud, and Eamon stated that the one thing for Miller to do was to go away. Miller replied that he did not want to go unless he could take his wife and baby with him, but Eamon assured him that he would send them to Canada later in charge of his own wife. Under this promise, Miller agreed to go, and Eamon procured a man named Enright to take Miller to Canada, saying that he was an ex-detective and could get him out of the way. Eamon further promised to forward to Miller whatever money he might need to retain lawyers for him in Montreal. Thereupon Miller exchanged hats with someone in Eamon's office and started for Canada in the custody of the lawyer's representative. How the wily colonel must have chuckled as poor Miller trotted down the stairs like a sheep leaving his fleece behind him. A golden fleece, indeed. Did ever a lawyer have such a piece of luck? Here was a little fellow who had invented a brilliant scheme to get away with other people's money and had carried it through successfully, more than successfully, beyond the dreams of even the most avaricious criminal, and then, richer than Midas, had handed over the whole jolly fortune to another, for the other's asking without even taking a scrap of paper to show for it. More than that, he had then voluntarily extinguished himself. Had Eamon not chuckled, he would not have been Bob Eamon. The money was stolen, to be sure, but Eamon's skirts were clear. There was nothing to show that the $245,000 he had received was stolen money. There was only one man, a discredited felon, who could hint that the money was even tainted, and he was safely over the border in a foreign jurisdiction, not in the custody of the police, but of Eamon himself, to be kept there, as Mr. Robert C. Taylor so aptly phrased it in arguing Eamon's case on appeal, on waiting orders. Eamon had Miller on a string, and as soon as Eamon, for his own sake, was compelled to either produce Miller or run the risk of indictment, he pulled the string and brought Miller back into the jurisdiction. Needless to say, great was the ado made over the disappearance of the promoter of the Franklin Syndicate, and the authorities of Kings County speedily let it become known that justice required that someone should be punished for the colossal fraud which had been perpetrated. The grand jury of the county started a general investigation. Public indignation was stirred to the point of ebullition 
In the midst of the rumpus, there came a knock on the office door of the Honorable John F. Clark, District Attorney of Kings County, and Colonel Robert A. Amon announced himself. The two men were entire strangers to each other, but this did not prevent Amon, with his inimitable assurance from addressing the District Attorney by his first name. How are you, John? he inquired nonchalantly. What can I do for you? Mr. Clark repressed his natural inclination to kick the insolent fellow forcibly out of his office, invited him to be seated, and rang for a stenographer. Amon asserted his anxiety to assist the district attorney by every means in his power, but denied knowing the whereabouts of Miller, alleging that he was simply acting as his counsel. Mr. Clark replied that in Miller's absence, the grand jury might take the view that Amon himself was the principal. At this, Amon calmly assured his host that as far as he was concerned, he was ready to go before the grand jury at any time. That is just what I want, returned Mr. Clark. The grand jury is in session. Come over. Amon arose with a smile and accompanied the district attorney towards the door of the grand jury room. Just outside, he suddenly placed his hand to his head as if recollecting something. One moment, he exclaimed. I forgot that I have an engagement. I will come over tomorrow. Ah! retorted Mr. Clark. I do not think you will be here tomorrow. Two weeks later, Miller was safely ensconced without bail in Raymond Street Jail. Schlesinger, who got away with $175,000 in cash, fled to Europe, where he lived high, frequenting the racetracks and gaming tables until he was called to his final account a year or two ago. The money which he took has never been traced. Miller was tried, convicted, and sent to Sing Sing. The appellate division of the Supreme Court then reversed his conviction, but later, on appeal to the Court of Appeals, it was sustained. Of the enormous sums turned over to Amon, Miller received nothing, save the money necessary for his support in Montreal, for the lawyers who defended him, and five dollars per week for his wife and child up to the time he turned state's evidence. It is interesting to note that among the counsel representing Miller upon his trial was Amon himself. Miller's wife and child were not sent to Montreal by Amon, nor did the latter secure bail for his client at any time during his different periods of incarceration. The colonel knew very well that it was a choice between himself and Miller, and took no steps which might necessitate the election falling upon himself. The conviction of Miller, with his sentence to ten years in state's prison, did not, however, prevent the indictment of Amon for receiving stolen money in New York County, although the chance he would ever have to suffer for his crime seemed small indeed. The reader must bear in mind that up to the time of Amon's trial, Miller had never admitted his guilt, that he was still absolutely and apparently irrevocably under Amon's sinister influence, keeping in constant communication with him and implicitly obeying his instructions while in prison, and that Miller's wife and child were dependent upon Amon for their daily bread. No wonder Amon strode the streets confident that his creature would never betray him. Now, Billy, you don't want to be shooting off your mouth up here, was his parting injunction to his dupe on his final visit to Sing Sing, before he became a guest there himself at the expense of the people. Miller followed his orders to the letter, and the stipend was increased to the munificent sum of $40 per month. Meantime, the case against Amon languished, and the district attorney of New York County was at his wit's ends to devise a means to procure the evidence to convict him. To do this, it would be necessary to establish affirmatively that the $30,500 received by Amon from Miller and deposited with Wells Fargo and Company was the identical money stolen by Miller from the victims of the Franklin Syndicate. It was easy enough to prove that Miller stole hundreds of thousands of dollars, that Amon received hundreds of thousands, but you had to prove that the same money stolen by Miller passed to the hands of Amon. Only one man in the world, as Amon had foreseen, could supply this last necessary link in the chain of evidence, and he was a convict and mute. It now became the task of the district attorney to induce Miller to confess the truth and take the stand against Amon. He had been in prison a considerable time, and his health was such as to necessitate his being transferred to the hospital ward. Several of the district attorney's assistants visited him at various times at Sing Sing, in the hope of being able to persuade him to turn state's evidence. But all their efforts were in vain. Miller refused absolutely to say anything that would tend to implicate Amon. At last, the district attorney himself, accompanied by Mr. Knott, who later prosecuted Amon, made a special trip to Sing Sing to see what could be done. They found Miller lying upon his prison pallet, 
his harsh cough and blazing eyes speaking only too patently of his condition. At first, Mr. Knott tried to engage him in conversation, while the district attorney occupied himself with other business in another part of the ward, but it was easily apparent that Miller would say nothing. The district attorney then approached the bed where Miller was lying and inquired if it were true that he declined to say anything which might tend to incriminate Amon. After some hesitation, Miller replied that, even if he should testify against his old accomplice, there was nothing to show that he would be pardoned, and that he would not talk unless he had actually in his hands some paper or writing which would guarantee that if he did so he would be set free. The spectacle of a convicted felon haggling with an officer of the law over the terms upon which he would consent to avail himself of an opportunity to make the only reparation still possible angered the district attorney, and turning fiercely upon the prisoner, he arraigned him in scathing terms, stating that he was a miserable swindler and thief who had robbed thousands of poor people of all the money they had in the world, that he showed himself devoid of every spark of decency or repentance by refusing to assist the law in punishing his confederate and assisting his victims in getting back what was left of the money, and that he, the district attorney, felt himself humiliated in having consented to come there to visit and talk with such a heartless and depraved specimen of humanity. The district attorney then turned his back upon Miller, whose eyes filled with tears but who made no response. A few moments later the convict asked permission to speak to the district attorney alone. With some reluctance the latter granted the request and the others drew away. Mr. District Attorney, said the wretched man in a trembling voice, with the tears still suffusing his eyes, I am a thief. I did rob all those poor people, and I am heartily sorry for it. I would gladly die if by doing so I could pay them back. But I haven't a single cent of all the money that I stole, and the only thing that stands between my wife and baby and starvation is my keeping silence. If I did what you ask, the only money they have to live on would be stopped. I can't see them starve, glad as I would be to do what I can now to make up for the wrong I have done. The district attorney's own eyes were not entirely dry as he held out his hand to Miller. Miller, he replied, I've done you a great injustice. I honor you for the position you have taken. Were I in your place, I should probably act exactly as you were doing. I cannot promise you a pardon if you testify against Amon. I cannot even promise that your wife will receive $40 a month, for the money in my charge cannot be used for such a purpose. All I can assure you of is that, should you decide to help me, a full and fair statement of all you may have done will be sent to the governor with a request that he act favorably upon any application for a pardon which you may make. The choice must be your own. Whatever you decide to do, you have my respect and sympathy. Think well over the matter. Do not decide at once. Wait for a day or two, and I will return to New York, and you can send me word. The next day, Miller sent word that he had determined to tell the truth and take the stand, whatever the consequences to himself and his family might be. He was immediately transferred to the Tombs Prison in New York City, where he made a complete and full confession, not only assisting in every way in securing evidence for the prosecution of Amon, but aiding his trustee in bankruptcy to determine the whereabouts of some $60,000 of the stolen money, which, but for him, would never have been recovered. At the same time, Amon was rearrested upon a bench warrant, and his bail sufficiently increased to render his appearance for trial probable. As Miller had foreseen, the monthly payment to his wife instantly stopped. The usual effect produced upon a jury by the testimony of a convict accomplice is one of distrust or open incredulity. Every word of Miller's story, however, carried with it the impression of absolute truth. As he proceeded, in spite of the sneers of the defense, an extraordinary wave of sympathy for the man swept over the courtroom, and the jury listened with close attention to his graphic account of the rise and fall of the outrageous conspiracy, which had attempted to shield its alluring offer of instant wealth behind the name of America's most practical philosopher, whose only receipt for the same end had been frugality and industry. Supported as Miller was by the corroborative testimony of other witnesses and by the certificates of deposit, which Eamon had, with his customary bravado, made out in his own handwriting, no room was left for even the slightest doubt, not only that the money had been stolen, but that Eamon had received it. Indeed, so plain was the proposition that the defense never for an instant contemplated the possibility of putting Eamon upon the stand in his own behalf. 
It was in truth an extraordinary case, for the principal element in the proof was made out by the evidence of the thief himself that he was a thief. Miller had been tried and convicted of the very larceny to which he now testified, and although in the eyes of the law no principle of res adjudicata could apply in Amon's case, it was a logical conclusion that if the evidence upon the first trial was repeated, the necessary element of larceny would be effectually established. Hence, in point of fact, Miller's testimony upon the question of whether the money had been stolen was entirely unnecessary, and the efforts of the defense were directed simply to making out Miller such a miscreant upon his own testimony that perforce the jury could not accept his evidence when it reached the point of implicating Amon. All their attempts in this direction, however, only roused increased sympathy for the witness and hostility toward their own client, and made the jury the more ready to believe that Amon had been the only one in the end to profit by the transaction. Briefly, the two points urged by the defense were, one, that Amon was acting only as Miller's counsel, and hence was immune, and two, that there was no adequate legal evidence that the $30,500 which Amon had deposited, as shown by the deposit slip, was the identical money stolen from the victims of the Franklin Syndicate. As bearing upon this, they urged that the stolen money had in fact been deposited by Miller himself, and so had lost the character of stolen money before it was turned over to the defendant, and that Miller's story being that of an accomplice required absolute corroboration in every detail. The point that Amon was acting only as a lawyer was quickly disposed of by Judge Newberger. Something has been said by counsel, he remarked in his charge to the jury, to the effect that the defendant as a lawyer had a perfect right to advise Miller, but I know of no rule of law that will permit counsel to advise how a crime can be committed. As to the identity of the money, the court charged that it made no difference which person performed the physical act of placing the cash in the hands of the receiving teller of the bank, so long as it was deposited to Amon's credit. On the question of what corroboration of Miller's story was necessary, Judge Ingram, in the appellate division, expressed great doubt as to whether in the eyes of the law, Miller, the thief, could be regarded as an accomplice of Amon in receiving the stolen money at all, and stated that even if he could be so regarded, there was more than abundant corroboration of his testimony. Amon's conviction was affirmed throughout the courts, including the Court of Appeals, and the defendant himself is now engaged in serving out his necessarily inadequate sentence. Necessarily inadequate, since under the laws of the State of New York, the receiver of stolen goods, however great his moral obliquity may be, and however great the amount stolen, can only receive half the punishment which may be meted out to the thief himself, receiving being punishable by only five years or less in state's prison, while grand larceny is punishable by ten years. Yet, who is the greater criminal, the weak, ignorant, poverty-stricken clerk, or the shrewd, experienced lawyer who preyed upon his client and through him upon the community at large? The confession of Miller, in the face of what the consequences of his course might mean to his wife and child, was an act of moral courage. The price he had to pay is known to himself alone. But the horrors of life in prison for the squealer were thoroughly familiar to him when he elected to do what he could to atone for his crime. In fact, Amon had not neglected to picture them vividly to him, and to stigmatize an erstwhile client of his. Everything looks good, he wrote to Miller in Sing Sing, in reporting the affirmance of Goslin's conviction, especially since the squealer is getting his just desserts. With no certain knowledge of future pardon, Miller went back to prison cheerfully to face all the nameless tortures inflicted upon those who helped the state. The absolute black silence of convict excommunication, the blows and kicks inflicted without opportunity for retaliation or complaint, the hostility of guards and keepers, the suffering of abject poverty, keener in a prison house than on any other foot of earth. It is interesting to observe that Miller's original purpose had been to secure money to speculate with for he had been bitten deep by the tarantula of Wall Street, and his early experiences had led him to believe that he could beat the market, if only he had sufficient margin. This margin he set out to secure. Then, when he saw how easy it was to get money for the asking, he dropped the idea of speculation and simply became a banker. He did make one bona fide attempt, but the stock went down, he sold out, and netted a small loss. Had Miller actually continued to speculate, 
it is doubtful whether he could have been convicted for any crime since it was for that purpose that the money was entrusted to him he might have lost it all in the street and gone scot-free as it was in failing to gamble with it he became guilty of embezzlement Amon arrived in sing sing with a degree of eclat he found numerous old friends and clients among the inmates he brought a social position which had its value money too is no less desirable there than elsewhere and Amon had plenty of it in due course but not until he had served more than half his sentence less commutation miller a broken man received his pardon and went back to his wife and child when governor higgins performed this act of executive clemency many honest folk in brooklyn and elsewhere loudly expressed their indignation district attorney jerome did not escape their blame was this contemptible thief the meanest of all mean swindlers who had stolen hundreds of thousands to be turned loose on the community before he had served half his sentence it was an outrage a disgrace to civilization reader how say you end of chapter five recording by colleen mcmahon chapter six of true stories of crime from the district attorney's office by arthur cheney train this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 6. A Study in Finance He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 28, verse 20 The victim of moral overstrain is the central figure in many novels and countless magazine stories. In most of them he finally repents him fully of his sins past and returns to his former or to some equally desirable position to lead a new and better life. The dangers and temptations of the street are, however, too real and terrible to be studied other than in actuality, and the fall of hundreds of previously honest young men owing to easily remedied conditions should teach its lesson not only to their comrades but to their employers as well. The ball and chain, quite as often as repentance and forgiveness, ends their experience. No young man takes a position in a banking house with the deliberate intention of becoming an embezzler. He knows precisely, as well as does the reader, that if he listens to the whisper of temptation, he is lost, and so does his employer. Yet the employer, who would hold himself remiss if he allowed his little boy to have the run of the jam closet, and then discovered that the latter's lips bore evidence of petty larceny, or would regard himself as almost criminally negligent if he placed a priceless pearl necklace where an ignorant chimney sweep might fall under the hypnotism of its shimmer, will calmly allow a condition of things in his own brokerage or banking office where a fifteen dollars a week clerk may have free access to a million dollars worth of negotiable securities and even encourage the latter by occasional sure tips to take a flyer in the market it is a deplorable fact that the officers of certain companies occasionally unload undesirable securities upon their employees and in order to boom or create a movement in a certain stock will induce the persons under their control to purchase it it would be a rare case in which a clerk who valued his situation would refuse to take a few shares in an enterprise which the head of the firm was fathering of course such occurrences are the exceptions but there are plenty of houses not far from wall street where the partners know that their clerks and messengers are playing the market and exert not the slightest influence to stop them when these men find that they and their customers and not the clerks and messengers are paying the loss accounts of the latter they are very much distressed and tell the district attorney with regret that only by sending such wicked and treacherous persons to state's prison can similar dishonesty be prevented not long ago the writer became acquainted with a young man who as loan clerk in a trust company had misappropriated a large amount of securities and had pled guilty to the crime of grand larceny in the first degree he was awaiting sentence and in connection therewith it became necessary to examine into the conditions prevailing generally in the financial district his story is already public property for the case attracted wide attention in the daily press but inasmuch as the writer's object is to point a moral rather than adorn a tale the culprit's name and the name of the company with which he was connected need not be given he is now serving a term in state's prison and is the writer believes sincerely repentant and determined to make a man of himself upon his release for present purposes let him be called john smith 
He was born in New York City, in surroundings rather better than the average. His family were persons of good education, and his home was a comfortable and happy one. From childhood, he received thorough religious instruction, and was always a straightforward, honest, and obedient boy. His father, having concluded from observation that the shortest route to success lay in financial enterprise, secured a place in a broker's office for his son after the latter's graduation from the high school. John began at the bottom and gradually worked up to the position of assistant loan clerk in a big trust company. This took 15 years of hard work. From the day that he started in filling ink wells and cleaning out ticker baskets, he saw fortunes made and lost in a twinkling. He learned that the chief business of a broker is acting as go-between for persons who are trying to sell what they do not own to others who do not have the money to pay for what they buy. And he saw hundreds of such persons grow rich on these fictitious transactions. He also saw others wiped out, but they cheerfully went through bankruptcy and began again, many of them achieving wealth on their second or third attempt. He was earning $5 a week and getting his lunch at a vegetarian health restaurant for 15 cents. The broker, for whom he ran errands, gave away 35-cent cigars to his customers and had an elaborate luncheon served in the office daily to a dozen or more of the elect. John knew one boy of about his own age who, having made a successful turn, began as a trader and cleaned up $100,000 in a rising market the first year. That was better than the cleaning up John was used to, but he was a sensible boy and had made up his mind to succeed in a legitimate fashion. Gradually, he saved a few hundred dollars, and, acting on the knowledge he had gained in his business, bought two or three shares in a security which quickly advanced in value and almost doubled his money. The next time, as well, fortune favored him, and he soon had a comfortable nest egg, enough to warrant his feeling reasonably secure in the event of accident or sickness. He had worked faithfully, had given great satisfaction to his employers, and presently had a clerical position in a prominent trust company offered to him. It seemed an advance. The salary was larger, even if absurdly small, and he gladly accepted the place. Shortly after this, he had his first experience in real finance. The president of the company sent for him. The reader will remember that this is a true story and the boy entered his private office and came into the august presence of the magnate. This man is today what is commonly known as a power in Wall Street. My boy, said the president, you have been doing very well. I have noticed the excellence of your work. I want to commend you. Thank you, sir, said John modestly, expecting to hear that his salary was to be raised. Yes, continued the great man, and I want you to have an interest in the business. The blood rushed to John's head and face. Thank you very much, he gasped. I have allotted you five shares in the trust company, said the president. If you take them up and carry them, you will feel that you have a real connection with the house and it will net you a handsome return. Have you any money? It so happened that at this time John's savings were invested in a few bonds of an old and conservatively managed railroad. His heart fell. He didn't want to buy any bank stock. No, he answered. My salary is small enough and I need it all. I don't save any money. Oh, well, said the magnet, I will try and fix it up for you. I will arrange for a loan with the blank bank on the stock. Remember, I'm doing this to help you. That is all. You may go back to your books. Next day, John was informed that he had bought five shares of blank trust company stock in the neighborhood of 300, and he signed a note for $1,425 and endorsed the stock over to the bank from which the money had been borrowed for him. The stock almost immediately dropped over 50 points. John paid the interest on the note out of his salary, and the dividends, as fast as they were declared, went to extinguish the body of the loan. Some time afterward, he learned that he had bought the stock from the magnet himself. He never received any benefit from it, for the stock was sold to cover the note, and John was obliged to make up the difference. He also discovered that 10 or 15 other employees had been given a similar opportunity by their generous employer at about the same time. John, in prison, says it was a scheme to keep 50 or 100 shares where it could easily be controlled by the president without risk to himself, in case of need. Of course, he may be wrong. At any rate, he feels bitterly now toward the big men who are at large while he is in jail. John continued to keep up with the acquaintances formed during his years in the broker's office, many of whom had started little businesses of their own and had done well. 
Part of their stock in trade was to appear prosperous, and they took John out to lunch and told him what a fine fellow he was and gave him sure tips. But John had grown wise. He had had all the chances of that sort he wanted, and from a bigger man than any of them. He ate their lunches and invited them in return. Then he economized for a day or two to even up. He was not prosperous himself, but he did not accept favors without repaying them. One thing he observed and noted carefully. Every man he knew who had begun a brokerage business and kept sober, who attended to business and did not speculate, made money and plenty of it. He knew one young firm which cleared up 15000 in commissions at the end of the second year. That looked good to him. And he knew, besides, that he was sober and attended to business. He made inquiries and learned that one could start in, if one were modest in one's pretensions, for $2,500. That would pay office rent and keep things going until the commissions began to come in. He started to look around for some other young man who could put up the money in consideration of John's contributing the experience. But all the men he knew had experience without money. Then, by chance, he met a young fellow of bright and agreeable personality whom we shall call Prescott. The latter was five or six years older than John, had had a large experience in brokerage houses in another city, and had come to New York to promote the interests of a certain copper company. John had progressed and was now assistant loan clerk of one of the biggest trust companies in the city, which also happened to be the transfer agent for the copper company. Thus, John had constantly to handle its certificates. Prescott said it was a wonderful thing that some of the keenest men in the street were in it, and, although it was a curb stock, strongly advised his new friend to buy all he could of it. He assured John that, although he was admittedly interested in booming the stock, he was confident that before long it would sell at four times its present quotation. Meantime, the stock, which had been listed at two and a quarter, began to go rapidly up. Word went around the trust company that it was a great purchase anywhere below ten and John, as well as the other boys employed in the company, got together what money he could and began to buy it. It continued to go up. They had unconsciously assisted in its ascent, and they bought more. John purchased 75 shares, all the way up to 8 and 9. One of his friends took 800. Then it dropped out of sight. They hadn't time to get out, and John in prison has his yet. But he still had faith in Prescott, for he liked him and believed in his business capacity. The stock operation over, Prescott began to prospect for something new, and suggested to John that they form a brokerage house under the latter's name. John was to be president at a fixed salary. It sounded very grand. His duties at the trust company began to seem picayune. Moreover, his loss in copper had depressed him, and he wanted to recoup if he could. But how to get the $2,500 necessary to start in business? Prescott pleaded poverty, yet talked constantly of the ease with which a fortune might be made if they could only once get in right. It was a period of increased dividends, of stock-jobbing operations of enormous magnitude, of 50-point movements, when the lucky purchaser of only a 100 shares of some inconspicuous railroad sometimes found that he could sell out next week with $5,000 profit. The air seemed full of money. It appeared to rain banknotes and stock certificates. In the loan cage at the trust company, John handled daily millions in securities, a great part of which were negotiable. When almost everybody was so rich, he wondered why anyone remained poor. Two or three men of his own age gave up their jobs in other concerns and became traders, while another opened an office of his own. John was told that they had acted on good information, had bought a few hundred shares of Union Pacific, and were now comfortably fixed. He would have been glad to buy, but Copper had left him without anything to buy with. One day, Prescott took him out to lunch and confided to him that one of the big speculators had tipped him off to buy cotton, since there was going to be a failure in the crop. It was practically a sure thing. $2,000 margin would buy enough cotton to start them in business, even if the rise was only a very small one. Why don't you borrow a couple of bonds, asked Prescott. Borrow from whom, inquired John. Why, from some customer of the trust company. No one would lend them to me, answered John. Well, borrow them anyhow. They would never know about it, and you could put them back as soon as we closed the account, suggested Prescott. John was shocked and said so. You are easy, said his comrade. Don't you know that the trust companies do it themselves all the time? The presidents of the railroads use the holdings of their companies as collateral. Even the banks use their deposits for trading.' 
didn't old blank dump a lot of rotten stuff on you why don't you get even let me tell you something fully one half of the men who are now successful financiers got their start by putting up as margin securities deposited with them no one ever knew the difference and now they are on their feet if you took two bonds overnight you might put them back in the morning everyone does it it's part of the game but suppose we lost asked john you can't said prescott cotton is sure to go up it's throwing away the chance of your life john said he couldn't do such a thing but when he returned to the office the cashier told him that a merger had been planned between their company and another a larger one john knew what that meant well enough half the clerks would lose their positions he was getting thirty-five dollars a week had married a young wife and as he had told the magnet he needed it all that night as he put the securities from the loan cage back in the vault the bonds burned his fingers they were lying around loose no good to anybody and only two of them overnight maybe would make him independent of salaries and mergers a free man and his own master the vault was in the basement just below the loan cage it was some twenty feet long and ten wide there were three tiers of boxes with double combination doors in the extreme left-hand corner was the loan box near it were two other boxes in which the securities of certain customers on deposit were kept john had individual access to the loan box and the two others one of which contained the collateral which secured loans that were practically permanent he thus had within his control negotiable bonds of over a million dollars in value the securities were in piles strapped with rubber bands and bore slips on which were written the names of the owners every morning john carried up all these piles to the loan cage except the securities on deposit at the end of the day he carried all back himself and tossed them into the boxes when the interest coupons on the deposited bonds had to be cut he carried these also upstairs at night the vault was secured by two doors one with a combination lock and the other with a time lock it was as safe as human ingenuity could make it by day it had only a steel wire gate which could be opened with a key no attendant was stationed at the door if john wanted to get in all he had to do was ask the person who had the key to open it the reason john had the combination to these different boxes was in order to save the loan clerk the trouble of going downstairs to get the collateral himself next day when john went out to lunch he put two bonds belonging to a customer in his pocket he did not intend to steal them or even to borrow them it was done almost automatically his will seemed subjugated to the idea that they were to all intents and purposes his bonds to do as he liked with he wanted the feeling of bonds in his pocket as he walked along the street to the restaurant it seemed quite natural that they should be there they were nearly as safe with him as lying around loose in the cage or chucked into a box in the vault prescott joined him full of his new idea that cotton was going to jump overnight if you only had a couple of bonds he sighed then somehow john's legs and arms grew weak he seemed to disintegrate internally he tried to pull himself together but he had lost control of his muscles he became a dual personality his own john heard prescott's john say quite naturally i can let you have two bonds but mind we get them back tomorrow or anyhow the day after john's john felt the other john slip the two american navigation fours under the table and prescott's fingers close upon them then came a period of hypnotic paralysis the flywheel of his willpower hung on a dead center almost instantly he became himself again give em back he whispered hoarsely i don't mean you should keep them and he reached anxiously across the table but prescott was on his feet halfway toward the door don't be a fool smith he laughed what's the matter with you it's a cinch go back and forget it he shot out of the door and down the street john followed dazed and trembling with horror at what he had done he went back to the cage and remained the rest of the day in terror lest the broker who owned the two bonds should pay off his loan but at the same time he had quickly made up his mind what he should do in that event there was more than one loan secured by american navigation fours he loosened a couple in one of the other piles if the first broker came in he would take two bonds from one of these but the broker did not come in that night john wandered the streets until nearly daylight he saw himself arrested ruined in prison utterly fagged the next morning he called up prescott on the telephone and begged him to return the bonds prescott laughed at his fears and assured him that everything was all right cotton was sure to go up an hour later 
The broker who owned the bonds came in and took up his loan, and John removed two American Navigation 4s from another bundle and handed them to the loan clerk. Of course, the numbers on the bonds were not the same, but few persons would notice a little thing like that, even if they kept a record of it. They had the bonds, that was the main thing. Once more, John rushed to the phone, told Prescott what had occurred, and besought him for the bonds. It's too late now, growled Prescott. Cotton has gone down. I could only get one back at the most. We'd better stand pat and get out on the next bulge. John was by this time almost hysterical. The perspiration broke out on his forehead every now and then, and he shuddered as he counted his securities and entered up his figures. If Cotton should go down some more, that was the hideous possibility. They would have to put up more margins, and then... Down in the vault, where the depositor's bonds were kept, were two piles of overland fours. One contained about 200, and the other nearly 600 bonds. The par value of these negotiable securities alone was nearly $800,000. Twice a year, John cut the coupons off of them. Each pile was marked with the owner's name. They were never called for, and it appeared that these customers intended to keep them there permanently. John, realizing that the chances of detection were smaller, removed two bonds from the pile of 200 overlands and substituted them with Prescott for the two navigation fours. Then Cotton went down with a slump. Prescott did not wait even to telephone. He came himself to the trust company and told John they needed two more bonds for additional margin to protect their loan. But he said it was merely temporary, and that they had better even up by buying some more cotton. John went down into the vault and came back with four more Overland Fours bonds under his coat. He was in for it now, and might as well be hung for a sheep as for a lamb. He was beginning to get used to the idea of being a thief. He was, to be sure, wretchedly unhappy, but he was experiencing the excitement of trying to dodge fate until fortune looked his way. Cotton still went down. It never occurred to him that Prescott perhaps had not bought all the cotton. Now that he is in prison, he thinks maybe Prescott didn't. But he kept going down into the vault and bringing up more bonds, and getting reckless, bought more cotton, quantities of it. In a month, 60 bonds were gone from the pile of 200. John, a nervous wreck, almost laughed grimly at the joke of his being short 60 bonds. At home, they thought he was getting run down. His wife, he was so kind and thoughtful that she had never been so happy. It made her fearful that he had some fatal disease and knew he was going to die. Up at the bank, John made a separate bundle of 60 bonds out of the pile of 600 so that he could substitute them for those first taken if the owner called for them. It was not likely that both owners would call for their bonds on the same day, so that he was practically safe until one or the other had withdrawn his deposit. About this time, the special accountants came around to make their annual investigation. It was apparently done in the regular and usual way. One examiner stood inside the vault and another outside, surrounded by four or five assistants. They investigated the loans. John brought them out in armfuls, and the accountants checked them off and sent them back. When John brought out the 140 bonds left in the bundle of 200 Overland 4s, he placed on top of them the pile of 60 bonds taken from the other bundle of 600. Then he took them back, shifted over the 60, and brought out the bundle of 600 Overland 4s, made up in part of the same bonds. It was the easiest thing going. The experts simply counted the 60 bonds twice, and John had the 60 bonds, or Prescott had them, down the street. Later, the same firm of experts certified to the presence of $300,000 of missing bonds, counting the same bundle, not only twice, but five and six times. You see, Prescott's John had grown wise in his generation. After that, he felt reasonably secure. It did seem almost unbelievable that such a situation could exist, but it was, nevertheless, a fact that it did. He expected momentarily that his theft would be detected and that he would be thrown into prison, and his fear of the actual arrest, the moment of public ignominy, the shock and agony of his wife and family, were what drove him sleepless into the streets and every evening to the theaters to try to forget what must inevitably come. But the fact that he had gone wrong, that he was a thief, that he had betrayed his trust, had lost its edge. He now thought no more of shoving a package of bonds into his overcoat pocket than he did of taking that garment down from its peg behind the door. He knew from inquiry that men who stole a few hundred dollars and were caught 
usually got as long a term as those who stole thousands. If he stole one bond, he was just as likely to get ten years in state's prison as if he stole fifty. So he stole fifty, and when they were wiped out he stole fifty more. And, well, if the reader is interested, he will learn before the end of the story just what John did steal. Somehow, Prescott's speculations never succeeded. Occasionally, they would make a good turn and get a few bonds back, but the next week there would be a new fiasco, and John would have to visit the Overland Fours again. That performance of the accountants had given him a huge contempt for bankers and banking. He knew that if he wanted to, he could grab up a million any day and walk off with it, but he didn't want to. All he desired now was to get back to where he was before. All the speculation was in the hands of Prescott, and Prescott never seemed worried in the least. He called on John almost daily for what extra bonds were needed as additional collateral, and John took his word absolutely as to the result of the transactions. He could not do otherwise, for one word from Prescott would have ruined him. Before long, the pile of 200 overland force was gone. So was a large quantity of other securities, for John and Prescott had dropped cotton and had gone plunging into the stock market. Here, however, they had no better success than before. Of course, a difficulty arose when the interest on the overland fours came due. The coupons had to be cut by someone in the bank, and although John usually cut them, he did not always do so. Sometimes the loan clerk himself would take a hand and call for a particular lot of bonds, John, however, was now fertile in devices. The owner of the larger pile of 600 bonds usually wrote to have his coupons cut about the 27th of April. John would make up a collection of 600 bonds of the same sort, carry them up, and cut the coupons in the loan cage. The other man generally sent in a draft for his interest on the 2nd or 3rd of May. But now the bonds were away, scattered all over the street. So John started a new operation to get the bonds back and straighten out the coupon tangle. He substituted with the brokers an equal number of bonds of other companies, the interest upon which was not yet due. There was a large block of electric fives and Cumberland fours, which served his purpose admirably, and thus he kept up with the game. When the coupons became due on the latter, he carried back the first. It kept him and Prescott busy most of the time juggling securities. At least John knew he was kept busy, and Prescott claimed to be equally so. There were many loans of brokers and others all secured by the same sort of collateral. Most of these John appropriated. When it was necessary to check off the loans, John, having retained enough of the same kind of bonds to cover the largest loan, would bring up the same bundle time after time with a different name upon it. If one of the customers wanted to pay off a loan and his bonds were gone, he would be given someone else's collateral. Apparently, the only thing that was necessary was to have enough of each kind of security on hand to cover the largest loan on the books at any given time. Once, when the examiners were at work on the vault, John had to make up $100,000 in overland fours or fives from the different small loans in the loan vault and put them in a package in the deposit vault in order to make it appear that certain depositors' bonds were all there. The most extraordinary performance of all was when, upon one of the annual examinations, John covered the absence of over 50 bonds in the collateral covering a certain loan by merely shoving the balance of the securities into the back of the vault, so that it was not examined at all. He had taken these bonds to substitute for others in different brokers' offices, and it so happened that there were no similar securities in the building. Thus, the deficiency could not be covered up, even by John's expert sleight of hand. Of course, if there had been other bonds of the same kind in another vault, it would have been a simple matter to substitute them, but there were not. So John pushed the remaining 150 bonds into a dark corner of the vault and awaited the discovery with throbbing pulses. Yet, strange to relate, these watchdogs of finance did not see the bonds which John had hidden, and did not discover that anything was wrong, since, for purposes of its own, the bank had neglected to make any record of the loan in question. It would really have been safer for John if he had taken the whole pile, but then he did not know that the accountants were going to do their business in any such crazy fashion. The whole thing came to seem a sort of joke to John. He never took any bonds for his own personal use. He gave everything to Prescott, and he rarely if ever saw Prescott except to hand him securities.' 
One day Prescott walked right into the bank itself, and John gave him 165 bonds, which he stuffed under his overcoat and carried away. Remember that this is a fact. The thing, which began in August 1905, dragged over through the following year and on into 1907. John weathered two examinations by the accountants, the last being in October 1906, when they certified that the company was absolutely okay and everything intact. On that particular day, John had over $300,000 in Overland 4s and 5s scattered over the street. In the first six months, they lost $100,000 in cotton. Then they played both sides of the market in stocks and got badly bitten as bears in the temporary bull market in the autumn of 1906, selling Union Pacific at 165, which afterward went to 190, Northern Pacific at 185, which went to 200, etc., etc. Then they shifted their position, became bulls, and went long of stock just at the beginning of the present slump. They bought Reading at 118, American Smelters at 126, Pennsylvania at 130, Union at 145, and Northern Pacific at 180. At one time, John had $550,000 in bonds out of the vault. The thing might have been going on still had it not been for the fact that the anticipated merger between John's company and another was put through and a new vault in a new building prepared to receive the securities. Of course, on such an occasion, a complete examination would be made of all the securities, and there would be practically no chance to deceive the accountants. Moreover, a part of the securities had actually been moved when the worst slump came, and they needed more. It was obvious that the jig was up. A few more days, and John knew that the jives would be upon his wrists. Prescott and he took an account of the stock they had lost and went into committee on ways and means. Neither had any desire to run away. Wall Street was the breath of life to them. Prescott said that the best thing to do was to take enough more to stand off the company. He cited a case in Boston where a clerk who was badly in was advised by his lawyer to take $125,000 more. Then the lawyer dickered with the bank and brought it to terms. The lawyer got $25,000, the bank got the rest, and the thief was let go. Prescott said they ought to get away with enough more to make the bank's loss a million. He thought that would make them see what was the wise thing to do. Prescott also said he would try to get a lawyer who could bring some pressure to bear on the officials of the company. It would be a rather unpleasant situation to have brought to the attention of the state superintendent of banking. John agreed to get the additional securities and turn them over to Prescott. Unfortunately, almost everything had by this time been moved into the new vault, and all John could get was a stock certificate for 15,000 railroad shares standing in his own name and $75,000 in notes. These he gave to Prescott, thus increasing the amount stolen from the bank without discovery to between six and seven hundred thousand dollars. This was on the day before the actuaries were to make their investigation. Knowing that his arrest was now only a question of time, John, about eleven o'clock on the following morning, left the trust company for the last time. He was in telephonic communication with Prescott, who in turn was in touch with their lawyer. Unfortunately, the president of the company had gone out of town over Sunday, so that again their plans went awry. For nearly two years, John had not known an hour devoid of haunting fear. From a cheerful and contented youth, he had become despondent, taciturn, and nervous. He was the same affectionate husband and attentive son as before, and his general characteristics remained precisely the same. He was scrupulous to a penny in every other department of his life, and undoubtedly would have felt the same pricks of conscience had he been guilty of any other act of dishonesty. The affair at the bank was a thing apart. The embezzler of $600,000 was not John at all, but a separate personality wearing John's clothes and bearing his name. He perceived clearly the enormity of his offense, but because he was the same John in every other respect, he had a feeling that somehow the fact that he had done the thing was purely fortuitous, in other words, that the bonds had to be taken, were going to be taken anyway, and that fate had simply elected him to take them. Surely he had not wanted the bonds, had had no intention of stealing half a million dollars, and in short, was not the kind of a man who would steal half a million dollars. Each night he tossed sleepless, till the light stole in through the shutters. At every corner on his way uptown, he glanced over his shoulder behind him. The front doorbell never rang, that his muscles did not become rigid and his heart almost stopped beating. 
If he went to a theater or upon an excursion, he passed the time wondering if the next day he would still be a free man. In short, he paid in full in physical misery and mental anxiety and wretchedness for the real moral obliquity of his crime. The knowledge of this maddened him for what was coming. Yet he realized that he had stolen half a million dollars and that justice demanded that he should be punished for it. After leaving the bank, John called up Prescott and learned that the plan to adjust matters with the president had miscarried by reason of the latter's absence. The two then met in a saloon, and here it was arranged that John should call up the loan clerk and tell him that something would be found to be wrong at the bank, but that nothing had better be said about it until the following Monday morning, when the president would return. The loan clerk, however, refused to talk with him and hung up the receiver. John had nowhere to go, for he dared not return home, and spent the afternoon until six o'clock riding in streetcars and sitting in saloons. At that hour he again communicated with Prescott, who said that he had secured rooms for him and his wife at a certain hotel, where they might stay until matters could be fixed up. John arranged to meet his wife at 42nd Street with Prescott and conduct her to the hotel. As fate decreed, the loan clerk came out of the subway at precisely the same time, saw them together, and followed them. Meantime, a hurry call had been sent for the president, who had returned to the city. John, fully aware that the end had come, went to bed at the hotel, and for the first time since the day he had taken the bonds two years before, slept soundly. At three the next morning there came a knock at the door. His wife awakened him, and John opened it. As he did so, a policeman forced his way in, and the loan clerk, who stood in the corridor just behind him, exclaimed theatrically, "'Officer, there is your man!' John is now in prison, serving out the sentence which the court believed it necessary to inflict upon him as a warning to others. Prescott is also serving a term at hard labor, a sentence somewhat longer than John's. The trust company took up their accounts, paid the losses of the luckless pair, and, owing to a rise in prices which came too late to benefit the latter, escaped with the comparatively trifling loss of little over $100,000. At once, every banking house and trust company upon the street looked to its system of checks upon the honesty of its employees and took precautions which should have been taken long before. The story was a nine days wonder. Then Union Pacific dropped 20 points more, the tide of finance closed over the heads of John and Prescott, and they were forgotten. Had the company, instead of putting itself at the mercy of a $35 a week clerk, placed double combinations on the loan and deposit vaults and employed two men, one to act as a check upon the other, to handle its securities, or had it merely adopted the even simpler expedient of requiring an officer of the company to be present when any securities were to be removed from the vaults, John would probably not now be in jail. It would seem that it would not be a difficult or complicated matter to employ a doorkeeper who did not have access himself to stand at the door of the vault and check off all securities removed therefrom or returned thereto. An officer of the bank should personally see that the loans earned up to the cage in the morning were properly returned to the vaults at night and secured with a time lock. Such a precaution would not cost the stockholders a tenth of one percent in dividends. It is a trite saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But this is as true, in the case of financial institutions at least, from the point of view of the employee as of the company. It is an ingenious expedient to insure oneself with a fidelity corporation against the possible defalcations of one's servants, and doubtless certain risks can only be covered in some such fashion. These methods are eminently proper so far as they go, but they, unfortunately, do not serve the public purpose of protecting the weak from undue and unnecessary temptation. Banks and trust companies are prone to rely on the fact that most peculations are easily detected and severely punished, but the public interest demands that all business, state, municipal, and private, should be so conducted that dishonesty may not only be punished, but prevented. A builder who took a chance on the strength of a girder would have small credit in his profession. A good bridge is one which will bear the strain not only of the pedestrian but of the elephant. A deluge or an earthquake may occur and the bridge may tumble, but next time it is built stronger and better. Thus science progresses and the public interest is subserved. A driver who overloads his beast is regarded as a fool or a brute. 
Perhaps such names are too harsh for those who overload the moral backbone of an inexperienced subordinate. Surely the fault is not all on one side. While there are no formulas to calculate the resiliency of the human character, we may demand the same prudence on the part of the officers of financial institutions as we do from nursemaids, lumbermen, and manufacturers of explosives. Though we may have confidence in the rectitude of our fellows, we have no right to ignore the limitations and weaknesses of mankind. It would not outrage the principles of justice if one who placed needless and disproportionate strain upon the morals of another were himself regarded as an accessory to the crime. End of chapter 6. Recording by Colleen McMahon.